Good evening to you, Simon. To you. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> good. Have, have you had good, a good, good? Yes. I hope oh. you've been well. Yes, it has been so nice. Nice to meet you once more again. That's great. <laughs> um, let's see, we'll be joined by a few more people, I hope. Um, yeah. I've got some communication from Chairman Tapa to you. Oh, yes. Yes, keep going. Good evening. You. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good. Thank you. Well done. Well done. <laughs> I hope you're finding it. Are you following the course? But as a tapa, I have got some some difficulties in some groups. Right. Two of my groups are not able to attend the classes. I don't know how you can help me on those two groups. Okay. The gadgets that way they were using cannot again access the, 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 the link. I understand. Okay. Are they okay. able to? I mean, <clears throat> I, I'm wondering if, if people are able to travel or or group together somewhere where there is, you know, good access. Some some are a bit far, but uh, it's yeah. a hard time because I always uh, follow them to to make a recap with them. Yes, I yeah. Uh, yeah. Because another thing I'm thinking is we could also download the lessons and have them on a drive, that and then it avoids people having to use the internet every time. Yes, yes. it's okay. It's okay. So I possibly can do that for them. Yeah. And then we can make it, we can make a recap to them such that they also get the information. Yes, because it, maybe because we can buy, you know, a, a, a pen, what do you call it? You know, those those flash drives, maybe, or yeah. something like that. But I, I wonder how big these, the, or the, the, you know, if, yeah, if we were to download the videos, we, we could look into that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, obviously we want to be able to share this with as many people as we can. Yes. And, 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 um, and that is... That is our pleasure too. We need to share with many of them such that we transform the communities. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. We have to transform whole communities, and and it, it can kind of create a wave if if we can do that. You know, if, if if because people people see it for themselves and then they want to try it, and you know, um, it's about finding the things that are holding people back. You know, the the limiting factors what's stopping yes. people from doing it it's a little bit of knowledge and just certain materials but not a lot they can begin with almost nothing okay it's okay that is yeah. the concern from tapa yeah okay nice 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 to meet you again oh uh, that's very nice to hear your report thank you and I, i'm really impressed by what everything that you're doing in tapa and you know you're really yeah. showing the way forward so we will continue to work, you know, to find solutions to these questions. It's okay, sir. Okay. So, uh, and good evening to you, Carolyn. Good evening, Carolyn. Yeah. Good evening. Um, I don't know where Gerald is this evening. Um, I'm going to... I'm also uh, welcome any comments or questions from people, of course. Um, sorry. I'm just, uh, how do I get rid of that? Close. Okay. Okay, well, I shall formally um, begin and say welcome to session nine 
of the Sector 39 2023 Permaculture Design Course. And um, I've divided into three terms. I want to kind of think about it in three phases, three steps. Um, we like that. I guess in, in permaculture, we've already had our sort of three ethics. Um, so our sort of a, our definition of permaculture, sorry, with the three ethics um, relating to principles and design tools. So it's nice to think in threes, maybe. So term one, our as uh, it um, was, we began with thinking about ethics. And I think there's a foundational set of ideas in permaculture is about the, the ethics and values that we share and the, how we're going to come together to cooperate. And we talked about the earth care, people care, fair share as a framework uh, to understand that. But really this fair share thing, what it really means is we're all trying to feed ourselves first. And we all, we all obviously struggle to meet our own needs a permaculture reminds us to, to feed ourselves first, but not to be greedy and to use our surplus as an investment to create change, to build systems that help meet our needs. We can, as designers, we can interact with the resources around us and make changes, manipulate the world so that it helps, helps us meet our needs and then also helps us build relationships with the community around us and with our natural world. That's, that's it's, it's, it's born out of self-interest, out of survival. And so what's not to like about that? I, I really like just to recap, the permaculture unit really is for everyone because it's about how we feed ourselves, you know, we, and, and accepting our place within communities and and, and having a, an active two-way responsi uh, 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 responsible relationship with, with the natural world that we are part of. So Earth Care, People Care, Fair Share. I, I like to shape the course, the learning around these 12 principles of, of David Holmgren's, and also to remind us that they're a sequence, so that it helps us kind of order our thoughts as well. And we've we, we talked, we began with observe and interact. Um, we're observing and interact to understand what are our needs? What is it that we're seeking to achieve? What are our goals? What resources do we have? What opportunities do we have? Um, you know, almost like an audit of resources, an audit of, of, of those opportunities. Do we have land? What does that land look like? Is it wet? Is it dry? Is it fertile? Is it sandy? We observe and interact, ask questions, and we begin to understand where we are and begin to anticipate how we build relationships with the things around us. Our next set of strategies is what we learn when we look at nature is Everything in nature conspires to catch and store energy, to slow things down, to trap it, fold it into complex ecosystems so that resources can, you know, yeah, we have, the, we have the energy, we have the, we have the components with which we can build ecosystems. Ecosystems that feed us and feed the other parts of it. So we, we catch and store energy so that we can obtain a yield, so that we can feed ourselves and then feed our community. And, and in the process, that brings us into being part of a system, a social system, an economic system, an ecological system. And we also talked a bit about Gaia theory and uh, 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 the nature of how everything is on one level interconnected, that we're, we're just part actually of a we almost look at our planet, we can look at our planet as if it's a single ecosystem that we're only part of. Um, but we can look at everything as a microcosm of that, a smaller version of that. So your garden, your farm, your compost heap, you can see that, what's in a pond, you start to see that as also a system. 
and we begin to understand that there are worlds within worlds within worlds communicating in different levels. Our world is complicated. Permaculture helps us use patterns and use logic to make sense of that, uh, of, of the complexity. So getting up to this, this idea that everything's connected and, 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 and therefore, if everything's connected in some way included in some system, whether it's a system nested within another system or we're looking at the whole, uh, 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 the whole planetary system, is what that actually means is that resources aren't being used up. They're just moving around. So the next two principles are, are give us the insight. And this is, I think, this is so term two. We've, we, 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 we've been given this idea and our first four principles that we're part of a dynamic interconnected world. And we're also um, given an idea that so if we make conscious choices through a set of ethics of how we interact with that dynamic interconnected world, we can begin to meet our own needs, but not just our own needs, the needs of the system that we're part of. A good gardener builds soil. We don't just produce food, we produce food and, and all of the other parts of that ecosystem and we're building soil, which means that that system can carry on. That's what we mean by sustainable or really regenerative, something that's building on itself and growing. So that was, that's what we've learned in the first term. And some of that's a bit abstract. Some of that's thinking on a planetary scale. Okay, now I'm gonna focus you on Let's get detail. Let's start thinking about how we're going to, you know, uh, utilize what we have around us. So the principle five, and this is what the, the next thing that we're now thinking about is it's use and value natural resources and services. And we're going to go into this a bit and really begin to understand what we mean by that. Now the icon in this, we touched on last week, it's a horse, a working horse, the kind of animal that might, you know, pull a plow or a cart, uh, uh, you know, do work for us. You know, you might visualize an, an, an oxen or, or whatever works for you. But thinking about um, something that's powered by nature, you know, horses eat grass and give us manure. They're, they're mammals just like us. Uh, if you fall asleep behind the wheel of a tractor, you crash. If you fall asleep behind a car, a horse, it just knows the way home. Um, so let's think about using and valuing natural resources and, and services. Let nature take its course. Okay. I'm going to read this bit out because it's key. Renewable resources are those that are renewed and replaced by natural processes over reasonable periods without the need for non-renewable inputs. In the language of business, renewable resources should be seen as our sources of income, while non-renewable resources can be thought of as capital assets. Spending your capital assets for day-to-day -day living is never going to be sustainable. So permaculture design should aim to make the best use of the renewable natural resources. And we're going to do that to manage and maintain the yields that we depend on. We might use some non-renewable resources in that process, but we will only use those for establishing the system. So yes, you can use a digger or a, a, a tractor to excavator to build a dam or a pond a permanent feature that's going to nourish the landscape have a long create its own yields it's going to pay back the energy that you've put into it but if you're managing the system by burning lots of oil you're not going to be sustainable so that's our theme and uh, it actually relates very very closely to the next one i, I may as well just touch on it it's, Principle six, which is the halfway point of the 12 principles, is waste not, want not. 
uh, produce no waste. And we're given the icon of a worm. And really, this is the same, or it's the other side of principle five is when you work with local and natural resources, the waste that you generate can be returned back into the system again. They can be composted or reincorporated back into the system again. That means that there is that there isn't doesn't have to be scarcity. I think we we become to re regard resources as things that you know we're worried that they're running out. We're running out of soil, running out of oil, we're running out of water. Understand that these things actually don't go away. They cycle through systems. And if we tweak and manage those systems, we can catch and store them and we can develop yields from them that sustain us. So the other theme for this lecture and the next, well, the next couple really is from Bill Mollison's book is Earthworks. Earthworks as in how we might shape the landscape, work with the landscape so that we can build its capacity to grow food, to support plants, to hold water, to be, to create, and to allow us to create new ecosystems. So we're letting nature take its course, working with natural flows, working with natural materials and realizing that the materials that you have, that you need, you have, they are there already where you are. And then you, you can use the, the basics of what is there, soil, water, air, and to grow and produce the materials then that you need to extend the system. So let's try and think about how we can assemble the materials that we need to build a system that's then going to nourish us. Okay, that's our uh, opening thoughts. And I'm going to I'm going to talk about vetiver. We're on a theme of use and value natural resources and services. Okay. Natural resources and services. That's nothing more complicated than the fact that it's it, 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 rain and gravity, soil. Let's think of it in the simplest thing. And plants. This slideshow, I'm, I'm going to skate through. There's a lot of material in here. This is a, almost a lifetime of work for our friend, um, uh, Jane Wageza, who is in Kenya, and I see her email there. I don't know if it's out of date or not, but she um, is part of uh, Land Restoration uh, Systems Network and is trained to use vetiver as a tool for rebuilding damaged landscapes, for trapping water, for building soil. So within a context of use and value natural resources and services, we're going to really go deep on the natural resource called vetiver and the services that it offers us and the incredibly powerful things that we can do with it. So number one, it's a grass. It's a form of grass and you, it's easy to propagate. So once you have some, if you look after it, you can make a lot more. And if you've started that process, you can make more and more. So this is, this is a, a tool that it could be accessible. Should we, should it be relevant for us? You know, it's, it, 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 um, but this is a very, very powerful tool. And again, it shows you how we can, having a, a basic understanding of how things work, we can transform whole landscapes. So there's credit here to the Vetiver Network International, uh, plus Kenya, uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff. As I say, I will skate over this a little bit because it's not my slideshow and it goes very deep into the subject. So let's say this is um, uh, an, uh, 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 
a, a brief introduction to the really exciting topic of vetiver and here we are look there's a vetiver network international and here's how to connect with them um it's a global network of people who are with a vision to enable society to manage land and water resources sustainably and with the mission to motivate educate for the adoption of innovative sustainable land and water resource management practices okay um you can download these slideshows from the website so you can go back and you can look it into it uh, more deeply there's a lot of different aspects to how these vetiver grasses can be used but clearly if you're going to work with them you're going to need a nursery you're going to need to learn how to propagate them and, and to build a supply um, but they're very useful in soil and water and conservation it can be used on and off farms and for watershed protection Look, they're talking about bioengineering, stabilizing roads and embankments, protecting waterways, uh, reclaiming disturbed land. But actually, there's uh, so many more uses. So let's just get, get into a little bit. And let's talk about the plant a bit. Is The origin of this plant is in, from southern India, and it's distributed around the world. It's... It's a non-fertile species, this uh, Chrysopogon zizanioides, what a great word. Um, um, it's, it's spread by root propagation. So it, um, it, it doesn't set seed, and so it does, it's a non-invasive plant, and it's a, it's a wetland plant. Um, and it has an absolutely crazy root system enormously deep root system uh, which makes it a very tough and resilient plant um, we are seeing here i can't imagine that is many feet at several meters and i'm seeing an enormous root mass um, so it's a long living perennial grass, extremely deep, massively penetrating, fine, strong, soil binding root system. It reinforces the soil structure. It also has very stiff stems, which form a dense hedge, and which is very effective for slowing water flow. And the top portion of the plant is flexible and bendy. And, um, acts also as an energy dissipator. It grows under an extremely wide range of conditions. It, it can tolerate air temperatures down to minus 15 and over 50 degrees centigrade. It's fire tolerant. It's tolerant to saline, to salt and to acidic soils. It can tolerate a wide range of, um, of, of, of rainfall and can even survive when it's um, submerged for up to 50 days. Saline tolerant and uh, can tolerate high levels of heavy metals. So, and it's resistant to most pests and diseases. So this is a tough, a tough plant that only spreads if you dig it up and spread the roots. Um, now, as I say, this goes into a lot of depth. Um, here is a nine month year old plant with 3.3 meter root systems. And that's the root system of the mother plant. So try to imagine what this plant would do in terms of anchoring the soil and, and soil building. Think about how much surface area there is around those roots. Think about how much sugar that plant is putting down into the soil and how many interactions there are going on around those roots um, in terms of soil microbes. It's, in, it's a soil building, soil stabilizing plant that tolerates 
tol that's tolerant of both fire and water. And you can see why it's tolerant. It's so tough. It's because when you've got a root system like that, it can access and store huge amounts of energy. Even if the top is burnt off, it can regrow. So you can see it talked about the, the lower um, stems become quite woody and tough. And if you plant a line of these, you can create a hedge, you can create a barrier. Um, the tops of the grasses have been trimmed off and that's a yield. You can take those off and, and uh, do numerous things with them as well, which we will explore. We're using and valuing natural resources and services. And also in the back of our mind, we've got this idea about earthworks, about how we shape the land and sculpt the land to catch and store energy and build yields. This is how now in our term two of our permaculture course, we're beginning to think about how we might bring these things together to create long term systems changes. C can we create the building blocks for long term change? Things that we could create then edges that succession can come from. That, that's what our objective is as permaculture designers, not just to randomly create raised beds and sap gardens. We want to build systems that nourish us. So, um, yeah, it grows fast. It's a vigorous plant. And what we know already from what we've talked about in our Catch and Swim Energy is we want to, in terms of water flow, water management, we want to slow water down always so it doesn't erode and we do that by slow it down spread it sideways and get it to percolate into the ground and look here's a vetiver hedge planted on contour that's close together um let's get a bit further into this there's, there's, there's lots of lovely pictures we can see um imagine now on if we had a piece of eroded degraded land Look how water would rain, rainfall would pass through this landscape very very quickly and be lost so look imagine here rainwater coming down down this hill very very quickly drying out but instead we've made an intervention where we've planted a hedge of vetiver across the contour so now if we have a heavy rainfall the water is hits the hedge slows down sinks into the sinks into the aquifer and starts to recharge the um the groundwater and um <clears throat> and stops the erosion you'll have deposition will happen behind these each time where you have a row of vet vetiver <clears throat> so with our permaculture way of thinking we realize that we could utilize plants like this by planting them strategically in a way in which they help us trap water and stop soil erosion um there's lots of other um other benefits that we might be able to get from this but so this is just the beginning of our journey and, and not forgetting of course that there's all these other byproducts from the vetiver so we're using it to manage a landscape but we can cut it and feed it to animals use it for fodder for, for goats we can uh, use it as a mulch you can uh, weave and make artifacts from the uh, from the from the, uh, you know baskets and so forth um people use vetiver hedges for pest control to break up field boundaries so that um, um insects like stem borer and army worm are, are reduced in their ability to uh, to cross, and um, if they eat the vetiver, um, it will it's it's will kill most insects. Um, it, it, if all of these benefits weren't enough, is vetiver also has uh, a, a very um, a important essential aromatic oil. It's used in perfumes and, and it's highly valuable. Um, it can also be used as a as a as a mosquito repellent. Um, but 
Um, hey, this is a plant with many, many uses. So we talked about in our early principles was in permaculture, we're interested with in elements that perform multiple functions. Well, here we've got a deep rooted drought and fire tolerant uh, 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 grass that we can use to harvest water, stabilize soils and cut as a fodder and a mulch and etc. So think, think about how in permaculture we can use elements like this to build systems. Lots of detail about different varieties, the spacing. We can't become experts in things in one, uh, in, in one session. I'm giving you the patterns, the details come next. But think about how um, working with these kinds of ideas and resources could bring about a paradigm shift. I think what we were saying, uh, Simon, is yeah, can we create a wave of, of interest in permaculture in a way in which, because once you get things, these things right, you, you don't want to go back. Um, okay. Um, there's lots to know. Look, here are um, erosion control plantings of vetiver on contour. Here's there's been a, a fire. This is in Australia. Um, the fierce bushfire has swept through. The vetiver um, has been burned, burnt right back. And just five weeks later, it's grown back again. Um, look how on this road edge, the vetiver is going to reduce surface runoff of water and prevent the side of the, the side of this road from eroding away. We can use natural resources like these grasses to perform very important services, roadside stabilization, um, uh, 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 water, flood water control, um, whilst contributing to wider ecology. Um, this is a vet of a growing in standing water. Uh, to remind us that it's it's also it's it is a marsh plant and it can survive uh, almost two months underwater before it dies. Um, so you'll notice in the pictures it forms a clump. Its natural shape is to form a clump, and the clump um, is made up of lots of different fronds, which just keeps subdividing. So what we're being shown here is. It's normally it's propagated through what we call bare root slips. Um, and we can dig up a, 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 a big tuft of it and subdivide it into individual slips. So there we've got just two stalks. And this is normally how you would see one with, uh, yeah, like a double stem and, and a little bit of root mass. And Tiller, one stem with a, a slip is with th two to three tillers together, a basic unit for planting a hedge. Okay, so that's a, that's a, a t it has, we'd call the individual stem a tiller and a slip is, has two or three tillers. And that would be the individual element that we would plant and Okay, the vetiver grows new adaptive roots above the crown as it traps eroded soil. So as it gets buried, it actually grows into the soil. Um, okay, here we're just looking at different ways to get hold of it. Um, the way that people propagate, uh, normally circuits supply vetiver is in these root slips. The one thing is you they do dry out so you've got to keep it in the shade and you've got to keep it moist otherwise you'll have to put them into 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 pots of some kind uh poly pots or strips um and of course the other opportunity is to multiply them as close to where you're going to use them um there's lots of detail there's lots of possibility 
Um, here we see people in India dipping the slips in a cow tea dip. So uh, new slips are stimulated to make new roots. And so imagine making a, a porridge of clay and animal manure. And by dipping the, the roots of the slip in that, it stimulates it to form new roots that we're seeing in this picture where it comes in contact with the soil it starts to form new roots so we can understand that and copy that process by dipping it in a muddy tea with some cow manure and start to use it in landscapes look here's wow well, here we're seeing how um actually every, the whole landscape is eroded away except for the bit with vetiver on it uh here we're seeing soil erosion look on a slope look how there's accumulation on the upside look how that the vetiver has been cropped so we've got a very short dense hedge so there's a yield that can be cropped composted can be chopped up fed to goats and look the long-term impact of the presence of this um vetiver hedge is that the soil is accumulating every time it rains bits of soil come down and they slow down catch and store build soil um uh, reducing erosion look this has happened in just 30 months here we see examples in ethiopia we see how you can see how vetiver hedges on contour supporting this looks like they're supporting some swales as well um this is at, at metu ethiopia the jimma coffee research station all right vetiver hedges from space so i see look here we can see them here too look um simple strategies what i'm what i'm saying is that on your annual landscape if you can build these systems and if you get it in the right place it's there forever it, it keeps this and keeps working you're reinforcing what nature wants to do um i'm seeing many different examples of combining uh look we've got one with the, joining onto a swale system um Here we have, uh, again, contour systems in Malawi. Here we're seeing uh, vetiver hedgerows, 90% reduction in soil loss, a 70% reduction in runoff, a 50% crop yield increase due to improved for soil fertility, soil moisture and improved, sorry, fertility, soil moisture and better pest control. This was experienced from slopey areas in Malawi and also we're seeing in in um Ethiopia um contour plantings of vesiva that create very stable field boundaries which we can then do farming intensive in between those edges of vetiva but be confident that we're not going to lose our soil be confident we're going to trap as much of that rainfall into the system as we can and realize that the, the vetiver is part of the yield of the system. Um, here we've been seeing st terraces stabilized with vetiver. Um, to say it's not my slideshow, but I just wanted you to, to see his, his examples in South Africa. Look how vetiver has been combined with growing maize um how and think of the many advantages that that might have and as we looking at these things think about using and valuing natural resources and services think how the vetiver gives a different yield to the maize but at the same time it supports the the maize because it's going to help in pest control it's going to help in water retention it's going to help in creating materials for for mulching um, and it's also going to give you something else to harvest at a different time of the year. So let's begin to realize that with our permaculture thinking, we're going to combine these ideas together. 
Um, here we're seeing really bad erosion, uh, erosion features, and um, and then here we're seeing it being resolved once again with strategic placement of the vetiver um, in the right places. So integrated into maize in Ghana. Again, this slide is stressing the potentials of vetiver for breaking up um, pest attack and making it hard for. OK, thank you, Caroline. That's a really good comment as well. Yes. Um, so. Of course. We've seen uh, here we are in Cuba again. So interesting. So, yeah, pulling and pushing, creating different edges, creating different um, habitats um, around crops, seeing how we can make sure that we're not losing soil, we're always stabilizing our soils. Um, have we seen some other examples in different contexts around the world? This is a great. Um, uh, pictures from Indonesia, what you're seeing there is that's the, uh, we're looking at a steep slope and we're looking at a vetiver hedge planted across that slope on contour and you can see the individual slips, can't you? And you can see that each one is planted just two or three inches apart and they'll grow as they develop, they grow into a solid line and then that, that can be managed so it doesn't outcompete with the crops that you're growing in the in the edges and the steeper the slope the closer together uh we're witnessing the placement of the vetiver hedges here we're seeing a similar system in kenya we're seeing terrible erosion around this homestead it's been resolved the strategic placement of elements to support key functions. Wonderful. So what, as we go into this uh, slideshow, and it, it does go on, and there's, 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 there's many more applications, we can start to get very excited about this. Um, I think we need to, to, uh, to get Jane in to, to, to tell us some more. But... Um, begin to think about how the principles behind this as well and vetiver is not the only plant we can use look around and see what similar plants you might have available to you that you could use and that might have the same um offer the same functions um yeah Lots of, yeah, look at this, uh, riverbank stabilization, really bad erosion. Uh, again, a chance then to, quickly to, to, to resolve that very quickly and to create things which have, again, could be a significant yield. And of course, these plants can withstand flooding for up to 50 days. So let's think about, I mean, I think a lot about, you know, Lake Victoria or any large, water feature where you're starting to have regular flooding is this can have a, a real dampening effect on floods and also start to um you know reduce the erosive damage as well um okay so we're seeing again vetiver that's been uh uh eight meters underwater and it still grew back and uh and survives ultimately. So we're seeing just how tough it is, and we're starting to think about how we might use elements like vetiver to stabilize even really extreme landscapes. And I think some of these slides start to show increasingly uh, steep, damaged landscapes. Perhaps where there's been mining, um, other you know, uh, road building, of other uh, significant. Um, our interruption, you know, of, 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 of ecosystems. Um, think about 
yeah, it seems to be, it seems to be no, um, look how steep this one is. I mean, it seems to be no upper limit to what people will, will try. So again, think about how adaptive these ideas might be. Um, how it's, there's a, a big drainage feature and look how it's being protected with layers of, of vetiver. So again, um, interesting perhaps to speculate how these things might um, join together. So we've, we've, we've got concrete infrastructure, but protected by plants, combining strategies as well. So um, yeah. Uh, rehabilitating wasted land here is this is Kanat in Ethiopia. Um, begin to think about how plants again like vetiver can be used to kickstart regeneration to the, that that succession process that we're talking about. Look here, there's been a very big investment of stone um, uh, 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 to cross a. Uh, 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 obviously a, a steep erosion gully and that then of course can be reinforced with the roots of the plants so again thinking about seeing clearly how we could combine um built elements with living elements to reinforce systems so that they fulfill the function of slowing down water and preventing erosion and increasing the ability of that water to percolate into the ground We're seeing, um, anyway, I'm going to stop. It's it's fascinating to see these, oh, look where there's been uh, pipelines cutting through the grounds. So, so many, so, wow. We can solve many, many problems by just understanding the, look, the, there's, oh, there's still so many more slides. Oh, gosh. Yeah, it gets into very extreme situations. But look, let's just say I, I, we said this already. Is there's, there's no upper limit to productivity. There's no up. There's, it's, it, it's, if we can imagine something and arrange our resources strategically, then who knows what we could do with that? Look at these enormous erosion gullies and um, and they're putting hessian sacks, which will slowly rot to give a chance for the grasses to get established. And from that, they can grow back and look even after a flood. Being pinned to the ground by the roots of the vetiver. Okay. Um, now we're seeing examples of wastewater treatment. Okay, I'm going to come back to that because this is fascinating and I want to explore the principles of that a bit before we go there. Um, We're using and valuing natural resources and services. We're thinking about, about earthworks, terraforming, shaping the landscape in a way in which we stabilize it and trap more water. So we've just seen some examples about how we could use vetiver, firstly, as a tool itself to stabilize landscapes, achieve those things, but also how we could combine it with other interventions, swales, roads, dams, uh, 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 gully erosion um, uh, uh, prevention. All of those things can be supported by having strategic plantings of vetiver and other plants. So there we're beginning to think about how strategic placement of elements to um, add significant value to the whole system to actually raise the potential of that system to produce. Okay, I'm gonna 
look at a few slides now um, from uh, North Wales. I'm going to um, attribute Chris Dixon for these slides. Uh, we've just been looking at Jane Wagaza's slides on Vetiver uh, from Kenya, and this is Chris Dixon from North Wales, and he is um, he's he's been a, a permaculture mentor to me for many years. And some of his slideshows, I, I come back to think about the, the lessons that he had within them. So I'm going to talk about this a little bit now. And it's an appreciation of how water moves through landscape, um, along with a few other observations that he's made. Chris is a very good observer and, and a learner and a deep thinker. And I hope to share a few more of his slides uh, later on. This is the North Wales landscape, and it's typically been heavily grazed. We have a very much of a monoculture. Um, most of the forests were removed and the landscape grazed by sheep. At a certain point in history, um, the government made a big intervention and planted a lot of uplands with trees but as a monoculture and trees that were to, to be harvested you know as, as a crop not uh, not for as, as an ecosystem and of course the problem is that um we can see this carpet of a single species or probably sicker spruce or something um through this landscape and i don't know if this has been harvested above but look at the so, uh, landscape that's denuded and exposed um, with this bare rock um, or and, and, and thin soils or um, covered in a carpet of a monoculture species of trees, uh, which of course at some point are harvested so that then those soils are exposed, they dry out in the sun and they're washed away in the rain. This, these are two slides um, about erosion. And this is the side of, this is the side of the mountain uh, called Cadaridris, that is in uh, it's the highest mountain in the mid, mid part of Wales, and looking at an, a very ancient glacial landscape. And actually, you're seeing the very beginnings of soil formation happening there. There's bare rocks sticking out into the ground, into the air, um, freeze in the winter, expand in the summer, water gets into the cracks, freezes and expands, the rocks crack and crumble, break, slowly break into pieces. Gravity takes its course, and these these minerals become the source of future soils further down the valley. Well, Chris likes to tell a story to go with this picture, and he said, and this is an area where um, it can be quite touristic, and people like to go walking and you know walking in the mountains and, and so forth. And there are some well-established footpaths and routes over these hills, and. There's an area up at the top of this hillside here that um, it's kind of a bit of a marsh, a bit of a bog. So when it rains, it would be, you know, it would become very muddy and marshy and boggy. And, and that was where the path went. And so the people responsible for the park, they, they had some uh, volunteers you know, working and they wanted to improve the path. So they thought, well, let's. We'll, we'll take out all that marshy, muddy, messy stuff, mud, and, and replace, put some gravel down and a pipe so that when it rains, the water doesn't well up in this place. It flows through and, you know, discharged down the hill. So that's what they did. And then the next time there was a significant rainfall, that little pipe moving that water became a spout squirting water down the hillside and it brought the whole side of the mountain down with it look at this enormous landslide which was caused by just by the insertion of one little drain at the top of the mountain so there's, there's many lessons in this but one is this is a very extreme landscape you don't want to be making mistakes at the top of a steep hill you want to do your experiments down here where it's not so steep. So you're thinking about if you're starting with your vetiver hedges or your any other interventions, swales and things, start on the slower, lower slopes, 
and allow yourself a chance to observe and to learn. And um, if you make mistakes higher up in the system, they can have massive impacts. And sometimes just seeing something as, oh, that's a bit messy, will tidy it up. Sometimes that might create a huge problem further downstream, down the mountain. So have a real a, a sense about the interventions that we make why we're making them and the impact that they might have further down. So the images that we've just seen of Jane Wagaza's work, some of that working in very extreme and steep slopes, think about the steps, the thought processes that would have gone before they started making those interventions and think about how they would have started on the lower, less steep slopes and kind of work their way into it as they as they work their way up up the hillside um so lots to think about and lots to learn but i want to you know open up people's minds to the possibilities um so yes what happens is this is 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 um the forestry people come along and they just they clear fell all the trees um leave it to be dried out in the sun and all of that carbon is returned back to the atmosphere um it's a mess it's not a sustainable way of 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 of, of land management and and we see it going on around us all the time and it results in this uh soil erosion here we have we're looking further down the hill in the village below that forestry area there's the soil arriving there's the soil blocking the drains there's the soil filling the estuary of the Malvath River further downstream. So we're reminded that there's, you know, gravity, water are, are, are at play here at all times. And our precious resources are kind of slowly going downhill unless we're consciously making interventions to catch and store, slow it down, allow things to accumulate. We saw in the one of the slides of the vetiver how on the uphill side of the vetiver hedge, the soil was accumulating. So that's working with natural resources and services, allowing gravity to bring to us what we need, but then to catch it so that we can work with it. There's so much to be said about water. And we started to think about how the whole hydrological cycle um, and to understand that um, if we can slow down the passage of water and get it to soak into the soil and, and if we can work with plants with deep roots and we can shape the source of the, the shape of the land to trap the water into it, we can make we can make our landscapes really drought proof we can be much much tougher and stronger but, we, but there's a lot to understand about how to do that um chris put this slide in in to, to get us to think about how water actually moves down through a stream here we're looking at uh, uphill it's a mountain stream and th what happens is, is that the water kind of corkscrews around it and it bashes off rocks and it moves it, it, it doesn't come down in a straight line. It, it, it moves around like this. And we're, we're encouraged to think about how water has shape and structure as it moves. And then let's also just think about as this water flows down through the system, it's bouncing off rocks and, and eddies and currents. It's folding in air. It's expanding its... Um, its interactions around it um it, it, yeah bu bubbling and foaming and becoming oxygenated and so thinking about how this the passage of the water through the landscape is energizing it and cleaning it and also that as it passes drains through gravels and silts and sediments that water's being cleaned it's being um re-energized so this is another think about ecosystems services how streams and rivers 
actually a cleaning and re-energizing and re-oxygenating water. And we can look at these processes and think, ooh, we could incorporate these patterns, these, this, this, this water movement thing into our designs so that we can have high quality, fully aerated, clean water. There's very much that we can learn by just thinking about this natural process of how water traverses through a landscape. But then Chris, in his lecture, takes it to the next level. And this, this is something that made me think quite a lot, which is, um, he said, rivers can be self damming self uh, you know here, 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 here's, here's imagine we're looking at the same stream but there's been a flood and that stream is carried down now down the mountain trees have fallen over and boulders have come and then gravels come behind that and silts come behind that and actually the the, the action of the flood has dammed the river so now the water fills up behind that dam and forms a pond. So now the water slowed right down. So now the water is going to deposit out any silt it's carrying, and we're going to have uh, deeper water, which will be nicely oxygenated, which creates a wonderful habitat for fish, for otters, for beavers, for other organisms to move in, which then further extend that habitat. And and what we're looking at here. It's, 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 this is the, this is kind of an aha moment for for, for, for Chris, and, and 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 he really brought this alive for me. And I've thought about this ever since. Which is, what nature creates in these circumstances is a leaky dam. It's like a dam. It's slowing down the flow of water, but it's not sealed. It's not cement. It's not plastic. It's not waterproof. But it's 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 slowing down the water enough. So it's, the water's building up behind it to create a pond. And the water that's tr trickling slowly, slowly through it, it's been cleaned and filtered and, and as I say, and kind of oxygenated as, as, as it wicks its way and trickles its way through the system. So isn't it interesting to think about how the various elements in this system might tumble together and create features that perform like dams? Now, we're very interested in water trapment in permaculture. Our key strategy that we're thinking about all the time really is how much water can we hold in this landscape? So it's very useful to know is that there are natural processes that do that anyway. So can we, we, we can understand that and we can work with it. And we saw examples of that just in the use of vetiver. So think about how we might combine other plants and other elements together to um, perform these very important natural services of slowing down water and stopping erosion. We're not stopping erosion, we're, we're reducing it, we're minimizing it. Okay, this is, this is, this is, um, Chris Dixon is a keen observer. And this, what we're looking at here is a hose pipe, a plastic tube there going across a driveway. So the driveway, it's not a sealed surface, but it's compacted. It's where people have been walking and cars have been driving. And it's just a hose pipe just randomly lying across the road and it's raining. And we can see the water droplets there and the, in, the, uh, uh, in the little puddle that's formed on the uphill side behind the hose pipe. So this ground isn't a sealed surface. The hose pipe is just lying on the ground, but the water is arriving here faster than it's leaving on the lower side. So it builds up. So look, in a sort of microscopic way, you're seeing how swale works. You're seeing how it fills sideways and then slowly, slowly that water's allowed to soak into the ground. But we're also seeing how we might be able to create temporary ponds 
dams and water holding features just by compacting the soil a little bit on the upside and creating a bit of a berm on the downside. We can reinforce that with plantings of our vetivers, our other species. But it just in one simple observation, Chris is, you know, he's just helping us see how that process works and to see, look, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, it, the ground isn't sealed, uh, this hose pipe isn't sealed, but it works enough, well enough, to create the effect that we want. So, with that learning in mind, here is a swale that Chris has built across of his land. And what, what he wanted to do was to... Um, interrupt the flow of water coming down this hill to a wetland where there's like a surplus of water and he wanted to encourage some of that flow, that water to flow towards him this way to come to his intensive vegetable growing area so chris would say in his lecture of course that means that this is not a swale it's because a swale is always level so he called this a, a watering ditch and he gave it a Welsh name, which is Fos Dovery, a lovely word. And uh, 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 and it had, I think, a one in 200 fall. So the idea is, is that it takes the water a really, 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 really long time to slowly move. It's like you're nudging it in the direction that you want to go. You never want to accelerate water downhill. You want to make it go slow, slowly, slowly. And... As it saturates the ground, it then flows over it and, 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 and slowly progresses. I think it took several hours for the water to travel down it. But of course, what that enabled to do, actually looking at exactly the same angle in the second picture, what that then enabled to do was with the extra moisture, it was able to establish a, a field boundary, um, a guild of tree species that were also edible to horses and could provide extra nutrition and 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 uh, you know, whatever yeah nutrition and medicinal values for the horse and also keeps them occupied because they love to strip off the leaves and eat the bark and chew off every last little bit They're obviously enjoying every bit this looks like an ash tree some ash tree um coppice and so this is part of the management system. It provides a field boundary, a wildlife corridor, a water catchment, uh, stops reducing uh, any erosion. Um, this, this, this is a useful species, uh, potentially nuts and fruits mixed in to this mix of plants. Um, and also is this fodder there for browsing animals such as horses, it could be cattle, grazer browsers and um, it's another yield from the system that helps support other elements in this case the horse so here's an interesting little thing then is is that what chris discovered was that over time with this cutting branches and feeding to the horses and um these various coppicing activities that he would end up with large quantities of what we call brash narrow diameter wood not really great for firewood so much um and 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 maybe at other times you might just burn it to get rid of it but, but chris doesn't want to do that and he wants to do carbon sequestration he wants to value every element every resource to see how he could use use it to incorporate into the system so he started just for convenience bundling up all these piles of sticks coming from things like the horses and and then tying them with three pieces of rope, three pieces of string, one, two, three. And then you've got something perhaps that you could carry on your shoulder and you could use. And slowly the idea came is that he could create, so here we're looking at, uh, this is a waterway, there's a river that flows through here. In the summer, it's just very low trickle and in the winter, it would be a almost a flood. Um, 
Chris started throwing these bundles of sticks into the uh, across the flow of this um, stream in the summer when it was low, and then also then throwing rubble and subsoil on top of these bundles of sticks and building up layers. And he started to realize that in the process of doing this, he was creating a leaky dam. He was creating something that was functioning rather like the observation that he'd made in the woodland. That by slowing down the water in the stream, not stopping it, but slowing it down, it deposits on this side. And so the water coming through on this side is totally clean. No particles or sediment in it at all because it's been filtered through the dam and slowly slowly the up the upstream side of the leaky dam became deeper and deeper and he said the last time he i think one of his horses jumped in there accidentally and it went up right up to its shoulder so it was almost almost two meters deep so by again slowing the flow of water through the landscape using natural materials Chris had managed to then raise the water table on the land and create new potentials. So we've seen creative use of vetiver in really harsh and stream environments, uh, mainly in the tropics. We're seeing here bundles of ash and willow sticks being used to do the same thing, same effectively the same thing, um, and landscape remodeling here in Wales. So look, you're managing the landscape and realizing that every output from it is potentially a resource and your challenge only is to find out how to best use that resource then you're starting to think like permaculture okay so there's uh, some thoughts there from from, from uh, chris dixon and um his his some of his thoughts on water and landscape and um let's take a little gasp for breath how is everyone any any comments or questions or just thoughts yeah oh hi steve hi everyone yeah there, there's been uh carol caroline has been asking i don't know if she's still on Carol. So she's been asking about napier grass. Um, my my take on that is napier grass. Yes, it's multifunctional. It could work as mulch. It could do. Uh, it could do also uh, animal fodders, and also can be used for for the push and pull. The vector the pest control technique, but it's not as much purpose as vetiver. And also, if it's not well managed, it's somehow evasive, but then it's about managing or management. However, evasive it could be if you keep it managed, if you have the right elements. That's if you have animals, it's very good for the, for the animals. So you could as well use it for the animals as you, you manage it. Alternatively, is also to use it for the mulch. Yeah, so it's about utilizing what is locally available. If you really, you can't access, oh, Steve, you're muted. If you can't access vetiver locally, then why not? get the nappy and yeah. work around it we're definitely talking about working with the resources that you have not going oh I, I wish i had something else or you know but we're understanding the patterns but the other thing is what's the right correct thing to use for you is also is what's the yield that you need maybe i don't want to make perfume i'm only interested in goats you know to the, the your your choice might be affected by you know your intended end use what what are, what are the outputs that you want 
um, in a way in which helps build the system. Yeah, maybe something else, a similar, a similar example, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, what we locally call lemongrass, which is otherwise citronella. Anyway, citronella is one of the types of lemongrass, but it's also equally as useful. So as Steve said, what, first of all, which problem are you solving? Probably the problem you're solving gives you your steps or your next steps. And then after looking at that is when now you start scanning your environment to see whether you can solve it locally to start with. Thanks, Steve. Um, okay, my question was, um, can, uh, you know, vetiva, can it be used? We were talking about water and how we saw how vetiva helps in uh, accumulating the water uh, along the waterways so that um, the water seeps in and you know, we catch and store the energy. So my question was, uh, can vetiva, can, uh, sorry, napier grass do the same? Is it, of course, it doesn't work as well as vetiva. Vetiva with the root system is just exceptional. But can napier grass also do the same work? It, 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 we, we could almost say that all contour plantings will in some way help but the we're seeing now i mean the, the, it seems like the vetiver is the most extreme of those so it's an extremophile and looked how they use it in those super steep landscapes so i'm just going to say to you if we're doing something in a really extreme landscape then no it's not good enough but if it's just for something in a you know softer slow low slopes it's going to be fine so is it about the appropriate thing for the, the circumstances you're in and 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 the yield that you want you know, you, it's most important to you is the erosion is is erosion control the most important thing or feeding goats is that most important and we're sort of balancing out those priorities so if your land's super steep you probably need to go with the vetiver We'll, um, we'll jump into this next line of thinking. Um, I think there's, there's really more to go on this, but um, anyway. All of these topics weave together in, in, in different ways, but I'm going to, we're using and valuing natural resources and services. This slideshow is entitled Water Treatment with Natural Methods. So we can, if we understand the, the, the services um, offered by nature, we can use those to clean water. Um, we're talking about how we can use it to stop the erosive power of water reduce the erosive power of water and, and, and slow it down and, and direct it with, with 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 plants and with natural processes and let's just take this a little bit further so when we talk about water pollution what do we mean water treatment um so this is there's a term which is eutrophication and eutrophication means it means nutrients in the wrong place it means this water and gravity so there's a prediction isn't there? that rainfall is going to take things with it and they're going to accumulate at the but you know in the pond at the bottom or in the river they're going to pollution ends up in water courses 
a lot of what we regard a lot of what pollution actually is is nutrients in the wrong place and by that i mean um agricultural chemicals nitrates and phosphates um animal manure leachate from from human manure um when those things end up in water courses all those nutrients dissolve nutrients end up in water toilet waste um yes there's diseased organisms as pathogens but really what happens is those nutrients feed the algae in the um in the water it and it becomes eutrophic it it the algae grows so fast it becomes a blanket um and the light can't penetrate into the lower level so everything dies and as the algae dies the bacteria breaking it down fungi breaking it down remove oxygen from the water so ox the water is no longer being oxygenated and there's this film there's this sort of mat of of, of, of weed and the water dies it becomes deoxygenated and stagnant and uh, somebody probably not very advisedly has forced this child to swim into his pond um but it's giving us a good idea of what's going on it's really unpleasant and i'm feeling very sorry for that child right now um so the reason why we need to pay attention to water pollution is because we wash the nutrients out of the soil and they end up in water courses which then choke and kill them how we define how whether water is polluted or not in this way is by measuring its biological oxygen demand so there's a way of measuring how polluted water is and the answer is and the way that you do that is by measuring how much how much oxygen will we have to bubble through that water to decompose the organic matter in it biologically so if we go back here is how i'm guessing quite a lot so how much extra oxygen does that water need to be able to break down that excess organic matter and if we can measure that and that's what we would call we would measure that as we would call that its biological oxygen demand so without having to know all the details we're interested in patterns um we can understand that nutrients in water stresses that water course the water course can withstand those nutrients as long as there's enough oxygen as soon as there isn't enough oxygen the the decomposition stops and it slowly becomes eutrophic and another word anoxic it doesn't have any oxygen in it and the life that we're interested in promoting is oxygen breathing so we must be very aware of nutrients in the wrong place it's pollution and obviously any fish any other organisms living in this water will die and it takes a very very long time then to remediate it to fix it we don't want that to happen so as, as when we first think about how we might treat water that we have interacted with and used ourselves um let's use the terms gray water and black water for wastewater so um gray water is the wa waters we've washed in we've washed our clothes uh washed ourselves we've had a bath we've had a shower we've i don't know yeah clean the baby clean the clean the house um as long as we're not using toxic soaps conscious we're using a soft soap natural soap is um that gray water is only really going to contain you know, maybe bits of dust or food minerals um some nutrients maybe soap um be thinking about the chemicals but it's not hazardous and it's biological oxygen demand would be low so we can work with low hazardous wastes 
So again, like I was saying, as you start on the lower slopes, let's not do the really steep, scary bits first. So if we're going to work when taking more responsibility for treating our own water and making the best use of it, we can, we can have grey water systems. And we're going to explore a little bit like that of, of what we mean by this. But the first principle we need to understand is this idea of biological oxygen demand. The amount of dissolved nutrients in the water stresses a, the, a, a natural water course when it enters it by depleting the oxygen. So, and we're also going to talk about treating like black water. Black water, we mean sewage, uh, from flushing toilets, from um, uh, you know, wherever concentrates, where we have nutrients in very high concentration. So it's not just so um, black water um, would be loaded with pathogens, with disease, potentially with disease uh, causing organisms, parasites and so forth. Um, there might be toxins, there might be um, chemicals and medicines in the black water. Um, and there's also going to be a lot of, a, a lot of nutrients, condensed nutrients. So we don't want black water to enter into ecosystems and we want to treat it very carefully. And we might have dedicated systems for doing that. Now, we'll come back to that because there's, a, there's, there's, there's still a lot to say on this subject, but we're just entering into it slowly, slowly. So, um, okay. Um, if we want, okay. So, 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 I I want to to. I think the next thing was to say is. Wouldn't it be clever, cleverer, it would be an improvement to not put nutrients and potentially disease causing organisms in the water in the first place? There's a big question, which in the West, in the most majority of the world, we have embraced the water closet, water, flushing toilets. Before we had flushing toilets, there were disease outbreaks, cholera, typhoid, all sorts of different um, potential disease causing organisms transfer through toilet waste. So we have to be very, very careful about it. But one of the key questions is though is, once you put toilet waste into water, it then becomes mobile and it's going to wash away downhill, end up in the water course, cause eutrophication and spread disease. So when we talk about black water, sewage, toilet waste is, there's a real question is, why are we promoting going to the toilet in water in the first place? And the answer is a little bit complicated, but Really, we use the water and toilet systems for transport. It's just literally to get rid of the material. And here's another idea that we can bring into it is maybe it's not waste. We use animal manure, we compost, we, um, and we can bring that back into productive systems. What do we know about human manure? Can we use the term humanure? Humanure. The rules of even thinking about this are always wash your hands. No, is um, obviously we we we're here to minimise risk and 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 um, to understand the natural processes to solve problems and to understand that all resources are ultimately part of cyclical systems. But the reason that we have flushing toilets and water-based toilet systems is because in cities, high density populations, obviously those pathogens can move around. And, um, and so we've come up with controlled systems and that's what's given us this. But, and it was all for good reasoning. 
these are incredibly expensive systems to build, maintain, and they use enormous quantities of water. And water is this incredibly precious commodity. So one initial thought about um, water treatment using natural, natural methods is maybe we don't have to put all of our nutrients into water. So I've put in this uh, urine separating toilet. Is my 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 thought here is is that um when we talk about toilet waste, why are we limping it all together? I've already teased apart the difference between grey water and black water. So when we get into the toilet waste, let's just think about the difference between feces and urine because urine is much easier to collect and to work with than feces um so and interestingly urine is 95 percent water a little bit of ammonia, sulfate, phosphate, chloride, magnesium, calcium, potassium, sodium, cretinine, uric acid, and urea. These are all things that plants need. Of all the nutrients that flow through your body, that come out through your body, 80% of the nutrients that leave your body do so in the form of urine. So. The first thing that we can say when we're thinking about our um, using and value natural resources and services, water treatment with natural methods is maybe we could siphon off the pee, the urine, and use it separately. Let's not put it into the water course at all. Let's think about how we could use it creatively. So all of these um, mineral salts are useful to plants. 2% of our urine is actually urea, that's nitrogen. Nitrogen is the energy, the building block that plants use. Um, so, what have I got here? So, so this, the way to deal with something which is high in nitrogen is to soak it into something which is high in carbon. This is this is what we've learned in our composting. So if you've got a lot of animal manure, you're going to have to mix it with dry grasses and with leaves. You've got to balance the carbon and nitrogen because you're creating an aerobic reaction. You don't want it to be wet and without oxygen. So if we think about how we might, um, in this picture, we're looking at sawdust, something that's very, very high in carbon. Um, or we could even be using biochar. So, think of energy flows and think about the potential of how we could use urine, how we can buy, and this, this, there was, Every school in Uganda that I've visited, they have long drop toilets, don't they? And um, when you go near them, the smell is, is, is a really sharp, bitter sort of smell that crawls at the back of your throat. And that is ammonia. And that's actually the urea, that's the, um, uh, the, the, the nitrogen part of, of the urine coming off as a gas. So that's kind of been wasted, but it's also, it's a pollutant in, when it's in the air. Nutrients in the wrong place is pollution, uh, but it's also, it's unpleasant. And the reason that it's turning into a gas is because it's in direct contact with the air. And if it could be attached to something, like something high in carbon, 
that it does not go off as a gas. There's no smell. So that smell from the toilets, there's a lot of it is urea. And what we are, I want to give you is a term, which is there's a difference between absorption and adsorption. I want to give you a new word, adsorption. So this simple picture is saying absorption, a sponge absorbs water. So a sponge would suck, suck waters up, water up. So the water molecules are inside the sponge, aren't they? And if you squeeze the sponge, they come out again. That's absorption. Adsorption is more of a chemical process where the molecules of one bind to the surface of the other. That is what nitrogen does to carbon. It adsorbs it. And so if we have something like sawdust, here we're looking at our biochar. That's our biochar under a microscope, carbon particles with a massive surface area that would stick to these uh, little nitrogen molecules, stick to the, um, the biochar. So there is no smell and you're trapping the nitrogen in carbon, which gives you something that breaks down into fertile soil. So let's think about one way we can solve problems is just by removing the problem altogether. Now there's many social taboos around toilets, toilet waste, how you handle it and manage it. I understand that. So this is a difficult, can be a difficult area to, to innovate in, but at the same time, we're, we're stuck with these realities constantly and we're having to learn and think about, you know, how, how we turn waste into a resource and how we do it in a way in which um, there is no danger of passing on diseases. All of this maybe is a little bit of a preamble, but is, um, and I've been talking about this and using this slideshow for years. And, and, and I'm aware that this, well, what we're looking at here is a typical septic tank system. So um, in big cities, they have a big sewage works. Toilets are going, uh, toilet waste goes into water pumped out along big pipes and brought to a place where it's processed. If you're in a more rural setting or a smaller uh, group of housing, then you might have a septic tank, which is buried into the ground. And we're going to look at this septic tank and try to under understand a bit of what happens in it to understand a bit about this process about how we make dirty water clean. So my first point, of course, is Let's try and not make it dirty in the first place. But once we have done, we need to understand what happens. And in a flushing toilet system, it would discharge the waste into something like a concrete tank or a brick tank that's buried in the ground. Um, and um, the this discharge from the toilet would come in through this pipe and where it would hit a baffle or a wall or a connection of some kind so that it didn't shoot across the pond, but it's forced them to go down and, 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 and down into the water, uh, into the tank. So you imagine that water is actually fairly oxygenated when it comes in, but it's laden now with um, dissolved nutrients and potentially disease, disease organisms from the sewage, from the toilet waste toilet waste and with the water. Um, but this is an aerobic environment. And what would happen is it ferments. Any sugars in there are fermented by yeast. And the, the surface of here will become like a foam. It looks a little bit like the on a, on a, on a beer. Um, and that's because it's, it's the same process. It's yeasts fermenting, bacteria also breaking down all of the nutrients that are in the toilet waste and very very quickly the pathogens and disease organisms are consumed by the other biology remember that soil web picture it was five trophic layers well imagine how many microbes are in this soup of nutrients and um breaking down consuming each other 
and we have a, a sort of a fermentation layer that floats on the top and creates a kind of a scum, a foam. And there's also deposition uh, to the bottom of the tank, which creates a sludge. And normally, every few years, a septic tank is someone has to come along and dig that out and use that, whatever, treat that sludge. Again, it would have a very high BOD and you'd have to use, dispose of it carefully or process it again by composting. Um, so and then there's a second chamber in the, uh, in, in, in the septic tank. And again, is that, that that fermentation process of yeast and bacteria will continue. And eventually, as the water level uh, rises, then some of that water that's, that's had a chance to digest and move through the system can leave. So look again, the system's arranged to make the water travel the longest distance through it, to sort of circ circumnavigate through the system and leaves when it's had a chance to interact with every part of the system. So that water leaving the, the septic tank will still have dissolved nutrients in it and, and, uh, and all sorts of things, but it will be much more broken down and, 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 and much more digested. And normally what would happen is that the overflow from that septic tank then goes into a circle soak away system and where it can slowly percolate deep down into the subsoil um and slowly move away so basically the way that we treat toilet waste is we don't really want to know we keep it contained and we sort of get rid of it and <clears throat> as we reach resource scarcity limits or we, or we start to create so much waste out of our cities we're now becoming really confronted with what are we going to do with all of this compost sludge a toilet sludge and just throwing it away into the environment because we don't like it and it's a bit icky creates problems downstream just soaking it into the soil is well what happens when there's a heavy rainfall do we know you know what, what what's the capacity of that soil to absorb um, all of those nutrients without it changing the BOD. Think about how a system like this might be fine for low density housing, low density settlement, but how over time that would become more and more intense and it would become a point then where it's no longer appropriate. Also, let's think about our weather systems are changing. So we're having periods without water and then we're having intense heavy rainfalls maybe our flushing toilet systems and other things like that are not very climate proof uh climate resilient so there's a lot of things actually that, 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 that we need to bear in mind and be evaluating we want to understand not just how water moves through our landscapes but how then that translates to how nutrients and also pathogens might move through the landscape we want to understand this better. We want to catch and store that energy. We want to make it safe by being binding it into biology, by adsorbing it onto surfaces of, 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 of um, a soil carbon, which are also home to soil bacteria and things that we're going to access and benefit from these nutrients. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with these systems. They're very effective, but as conditions change and as you know, uh, weather conditions change and settlement patterns change, are they still appropriate? It's something which we need to be bearing in mind. Um, I think we should be perhaps at a point where we had a break. I'm seeing some chats as well. So I'd like to hear any thoughts from the, um, any thoughts from the floor and um, we'll take a little break and then we can come back with water treatment with natural methods. Yeah, sure. Um, let's, uh, let's have uh, uh, 10 minutes. Okay. And, be, and, and get back at uh, 
uh, that's about 24 past the hour. Yeah. Sure. See you in 10 minutes. All right, see you then.
Hello everyone. Um, it's time. Let's log on back for those who are away, and uh, for those who are logged on, let's uh, let's resume. Mm -hmm. Maybe just show me a thumbs up if you're there. Steve, we'll be back. Yeah. So, Maybe as we wait for the others, mm. you know, this water purification component now brings in two, two of the topics that we've talked about in the past. Yeah. That is uh, biochar and, uh, and then uh, vetiver, which we've just talked about both both of those two are really key in in the purification process if well if if well placed yes and, and as emphasized by uh by steve please is purely with gray water Unless maybe for agricultural purposes, yeah, this I mean cross over slightly, but mm. then also when you cross over, you have to be mindful of the people working on the farm, or even yourselves, uh, how you're handling whichever uh, processes that you're channeling the recycled water to. Back to you, Steve. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a really good point to be really conscious about the the, the end use and um, so this is this 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 illustration is is a handout that I've dutifully kept I think from the PDC that I did as a participant in 1995 so it's well traveled um, let's just um. It's talking a little bit about plants that live in water. So this would be vetiver, but it also is, there's many other plants that um, will grow in water, uh, bulrushes, um, um, this is a Phragmites reed here that we're looking at. But um, you, I've seen them, there's plenty in Uganda, you see it growing on the riverbanks, but these marshy plants that like to grow in wetlands is actually how do they do it because i keep telling you plants need to grow in aerobic environments and form relationships with aerobic soil microbes how do they do it in marshes when wet heavy flooded land that would be anaerobic well Here's our marsh plant, and here's its root system. And if we're looking at it in this diagram is, can you imagine that actually what's, 
what the way that these wetland plants, like vetiver, like this Phragmites reed, like the bulrushes, the way that um, um, they, they they survive, the way that they grow, is that they channel oxygen down through uh, through the plant and literally bubble it off their root systems. They're channeling oxygen and it diffuses out of the root hairs and creates a little oxygenated envelope around the root tip. And that is where the um, beneficial microbes will be gathering. And so again is the plant is creating the conditions and selecting the microbes it wants to work with. And what those microbes are doing is they're pulling nutrients, dissolved minerals out of the water and trading them with the plant for sugar and oxygen. They get it and through their respiration, they're getting the conditions that they need. So hang on a minute. What I've just told you is this, the way this marsh plant works is it pushes oxygen onto its roots and uses that to trade with microbes to absorb dissolved nutrients. Oh, so you mean to tell me the marsh plant cleans the water. It's extracting the nutrients and it's lowering the BOD. It's lowering the biological oxygen demand because it's firstly returning oxygen to the water and it's absorbing those nutrients. It's resolving the problem. Hmm. We could design with that, couldn't we? Imagine if we chose to work with these wetland plants, which can remove uh, 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 lower and remove the biological oxygen demand in water. So if we had, well, say, firstly, grey water, but we could do this with black water too, but we'd start with the easy stuff. So remember, the first rule is don't mix it all together. Don't mix your grey water with your toilet water because then you've got to separate it. Um, you've got to work harder to clean it. Let's work with the grey water. Um, we could put it into some kind of settling tank. So, and, and, or if we were working with, with black water, with toilet waste, we'd have something just like the, um, um, the, the septic tank that we were looking at. We, it would be enclosed. And we have our septic, septic tank. So imagine our septic tank, instead of it going into a big soakaway system across a, a landscape, is we might then channel that into a constructed reed bed system. We might excavate a lagoon or a pond and in it create the right conditions for the marsh plants, the wetland plants that we're working with. And those wetland plants can pull the nutrients out of the water, oxygenate it to reduce the BOD, and eventually treat that water and turn it clean, make it clean again. So this is called a constructed reed bed system. And um, we could construct systems to clean water depending on what's in that water. Is it gray water? Is it black water? Does it have toxins? Does it have pathogens? Um, what, to what degree does it have dissolved nutrients? We can, so we can, we can use natural processes to solve these issues, to remediate the water. So depending on the BOD of the water that we're treating, depending on how polluted it is, we might construct a reed bed system where firstly perhaps have a pond where so it's largely a water system and here we're seeing the um the water arriving from um, the pipe on one side and leaving on the surface on the right hand side pond number one pond number two is um 
a reed bed system where the where we've got gravel with reeds growing in that gravel and the water is flowing coming from one side going to the bottom flowing across and out so that is a horizontal system the water's coming in and going across sideways and then leaving and then in the third reed bed we've got a vertical system the water is delivered down a pipe with holes in it and then it's percolating down through the gravel and leaving so question why have we got three treatment ponds each one with a slightly different flow slightly different conditions well each pond would create a different habitat it would be populated by slightly different types of microorganisms that prefer different conditions and that because we've got a wide variety of sources because we've got three different types of habitat we're going to have a much more we can be much more confident that we've reabsorbed all those nutrients and of course we can always test the bod of the water by sending a sample off for testing um a really good way of testing the, is to flow the water into the final pond, which has fish in it. And if the fish are okay, the water is okay. Mm. Mm. Sorry, just receiving a phone call, which I shall cancel. Um. <clears throat> Dum -de -dum. Gerald, would you like to just summarize a moment? I'm just going to let me just communicate with my sister for one second. Oh, okay, please. Yeah. Um, I think most of us, as Steve said, are well versed with what we call the wetlands or swamps. Locally, for those in Uganda, the one of the common swampy plants is uh, what we call papyrus. So it's from that, that uh, and, and they use it to make lots and of uh, products, but then it's mainly situated in the wetlands. So it's one of those uh, wetland plants in nature. So as we said, Nature is our teacher. Most of the lessons that we are taking on are from nature. They are placed for a specific purpose. How about if we duplicate or we copy or learn from nature? Have you ever thought of, you know, creating a mini wetland within your system? And how much uh, it would really create or how how much biodiversity or you know additional elements it would pull into your you know your farm or your system so simply nature let nature be your teacher mm. let nature guide you when you see something in nature uh replicate it copy it transfer it to your system it's interesting to consider the ecosystems function of all of those marshes and swamps that you have in uganda um presumably holding a lot of water and cleaning it and aerating it and providing a lot of habitat for amphibians and fish and, and so forth and yeah um and steve yeah one of the if if anyone on the course can be critical, careful, when you try to follow up these wetlands, at some point they link up to either the lake or to a specific river, which is one amazing kind of system, mm. ecosystem linkage. So in other words, they are filtering the water to pass it on to the lake or mm. to the rivers, which rivers then pass it back to the lake. So nature itself is not a straight line, it's cyclical, is yes, is yeah, sure. 
No, that's, and, 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 and as we can see in these three pictures of these constructed wetlands is you would see the wetland as in it would be open water at one time of the year. It might be all muddy at another time of the year and there might be heavy rainfall moving through it at another time of the year. So actually, we're only creating patterns that you would see anyway. And understanding that, especially managed carefully, that these wetland systems are performing very important ecosystems functions, which is reducing BOD and trapping and absorbing nutrients and trapping and absorbing silts and sediments and particles, um, which allows to keep the water clean. We're looking at another example of a horizontal reed bed system. Um, and obviously the size of the reed bed, the depth, the number of plants, is a function of how much water you have to treat, how big is the settlement, how many people, or is it effluence from agriculture, or so forth. Again, there's a lot of detail, but what we're doing is we're understanding the principles and the functions first, and then we're gonna think about how we can apply these ideas to design systems that we want to build. And Wherever we are, wherever there's a group of people, we're going to be interacting with water and we're going to want to maintain the freshness and cleanness of that water. And we're beginning to understand that we can do that by copying natural systems, by having, um, here's, a, here's a nice schematic of a big reed bed that might be a size of a farm system. We've got settling tanks, we've got the first pond, sorry, the first reed bed and we've got a pond and then we've got a flow where we can reoxygenate water and then we've got a second reed bed where we can be sure that we've removed all of the uh, dissolved nutrients and then we go into a wetland system um, with wildlife and we can also monitor that its impact and observe at all times so um Again, it's, it, as we understand these things a little bit more carefully, the more we realize, oh, we could design models of this system. We could do things at different scales, couldn't we? We could start off with a fish system. If, 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 here's our integrated aquaponic system is we've got a population of fish, they're koi carp in this example. Um, and they're going to be eating and respiring and obviously that water is going to become laden with nutrients. The BOD of that water is going to keep rising the longer the fish are in there. So here we can see there's a pump, there's a circular system which is bringing the water from the, the fish environment and dribbling it over an environment of these are expanded clay beads. It's it's a matrix which is very porous and very airy and and the water will soak the water and hold the water and look the nutrients are being removed in this case by strawberry plants so we're turning the fish manure into strawberries and at the same time cleaning the water so you can return it back to the system again so let's think if it's true for a reed bed system or sewage system, we can basically, it's the same thing, a fish farm is only the same process. So understand the relationship between the biological oxygen demand, how high or low that is, and then how much work we have to do to clean the water again. Do we need multiple reed beds in a system? Can we just have one? Or do we just need a simple thing like this? It's all a matter of scale. So the first thing is understand these principles. Understand that to clean our nutrient laden water, we want to trickle it over something with a huge surface area. Those are uh, gravel um, um, and let's say these clay beads, absolutely perfect for that because they hold onto that moisture, they have a huge surface area and essentially filter the water and bring it into contact with the roots of the plants and we're completing our cycle.
Here's an on-farm system for treating the leachate from a cow barn. So we can see here the same thing. We've got to do something to diffuse the nutrient-laden water over a big surface area. So we're going to trickle it over stone chips. As it trickles down through those stone chips, it's going to come into contact with the roots of these reeds. What reeds are we using? Well, it depends on the climate zone. We're in a temperate climate here. We're going to use Phragmites reed. We would use what is appropriate for the scale of the uh, installation and for the climate zone that we're in. And look, there's it planted. And then there, there we have now a passive system, no moving parts, gravity fed, cleaning water. And every uh, season we can come along and we can harvest those reeds and we can find the highest value use for them. Whether that's composting them, or animal feed or, or a biomass, that's what we, we, we but our, our duty is to find the highest value use for each output of the system. Um, but in the meantime is we've conditioned and cleaned the water and we've removed the nutrients. If we got really creative, we could think about how we could integrate these systems into buildings, into cities, into high dense environments. Um, this is here's, here's an idea for a rooftop, a rooftop reed bed. Um, and they might throw up a, a, a other challenges, I don't know, but how creative can we get with our thinking? How much can we begin to realize with when we work with natural processes, natural resources, there is no waste. We have to understand the limitations. Yes, there might be pathogens. Yes, there might be toxins. But by composting things, by fermenting things, by bringing them into contact with, with my seed, with fungi and with plants, those toxins are broken down. They're trapped in the system. The nutrients are removed and the water becomes clean again. And the plants then become part of the yield of the system. Um, so here we're really creating systems using the, the, the roots of plants to clean water. Well, you can do it with mycelium. You can do it with fungi, Paul Stamets uh, tells us. Um, this is one of the leading uh, fungus, uh, mushroom experts, mycelium experts in the world. Um, a hobbyist, someone who's self-taught and who just had a natural curiosity for fungi and has become a specialist. So there's many ways into this. Um, he was, he is living in an area where there's quite a lot of cattle and settlement along um, the coastline and um not just nutrients coming from farms but also uh, uh, uh toxic levels of copper and zinc um entering into the waterway um people in the area started to look at possibilities for cleaning and in improving the quality of water entering waterways and Paul Stamets said, well, when you look at mycelium under a microscope, what you realize is it creates, it's a filter, it's a net. It's a huge surface area that will, in the same way as the roots of the water plants do, it can also selectively absorb nutrients, combine them into the plant, into the mushroom, body of the mushroom, and in the process, clean the water, remove, reduce the BOD but, and, um, and, and re by uh, removing the dissolved nutrients and, and digesting the solid ones. So let's just imagine here's um, uh, a str uh, some straw that's been inoculated with a particular mycelium and you can see how it's occupied that space. So you can imagine that's what it looks like on a cellular level. That's what it looks like to the to the naked eye. Now let's imagine woven sacks of wood chips that have been impregnated with mycelium that then become a biofilter. 
that um, they can be inserted in the same way into the flow of uh, the water or the leachate that needs treating in the same way as we saw it happening in um, the reed bed. It's another leaky dam. It's another way of catching and slowing down a resource. Here's our leachate from the farming system um, coming into contact with a, a large soaking into huge bales of impregnated with mycelium. And what Paul Samets started to realize was um, the mycelium can actually learn to break down certain toxic compounds. And if you give it a, 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 a range of different nutrients and then remove them one at a time, it, they will slowly adapt to absorb what is left. And he's trained oyster mushrooms to break down heavy crude oil spills and gearbox oil and toxic compounds. So this is now pointing to a very hugely interesting, really fertile area for exploration, because this is a frontier that we're only learning now is we can clean and rebuild degraded landscapes with very simple natural processes by making interventions in key areas. When we understand how wetlands reduce the BOD of water, we understand that the nature of pollution is nutrients in the wrong place, and that by building systems that absorb those nutrients and convert them into other forms, we can remove them from the water course. So we can use biological processes to turn pollution into yields and clean the water. Back to Vesiva. Here's our, let's just go back and think about now this plant that we've been thinking about. And yes, lemongrass is similar, napier grass, similar. Um, uh, this is the one that does it the most. So trimming removes the nutrients. And you can reuse it as mulch or green matter in compost. Um, you can you can also use the shoots to, for basket weaving and, and, and so many thoughts. So, and look, this vetiver is growing one to two meters tall and we're getting a, a, a really fantastic yield from the surface. And we can take those nutrients away now and use them in composting systems to, uh, or, or feed animals. The tough, woodier parts of the plant remain and can perform very effective field boundaries and field edges they help reduce the spread of pests and if if stem boring insects try and go into the vetiver they're killed by it because they can't digest it the roots of this plant open up compacted soil and enable the rainwater to infiltrate into the soil so they're opening up the soil and making it able to, to absorb. These fibers, this massive amount of roots going down three meters, four meters, um, they filter sediments and they absorb the metals. They um, prevent uh, 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 sediments from getting into water courses and they remove potential toxins. Then, just like as we saw with our reeds in our reed, uh, our reed bed systems is there's loads of microbes that process the organic compounds and also the chemical compounds that are trapped within the root mass. Think how much surface area, how much habitat that is for my, it's microbe heaven in there and how much mycelium there might be in there as well. And look how with this huge root system, <clears throat> getting right down into any groundwater. These plants are incredibly adaptive. They can grow in very dry areas. They can withstand long droughts. And at the same time, they can survive in um, waterlogged soils. So we have vetiver phytoremediation, wastewater processing. We're using and valuing natural resources and services. We're understanding how 
plants and fungi and 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 and, and wetland systems can be used and utilized to hold much more water in the ground to clean water and remove toxins from it by deploying them in strategic ways we've seen lots of examples in our vet of a slideshow and maybe in the future we could come back and look at that in more detail and think about what strategies we might have in different circumstances because we would we're still looking at the generalities rather than the details um now this has fascinated me so so you can also grow vetiver on pontoons so pollution is nutrients in the wrong place so if you have a population living on the shoreline and they're doing agriculture they've got animals they've got you know untreated sewage if that ends up in that water it's going to go downhill rainwater will take it downhill it's going to end up in the water course this is what's happening to Lake Victoria. This is what's happening to many standing large bodies of water is they are becoming eutrophic is, and they are becoming, they're having less oxygen in it. You can go, the oxygen is only in the surface layers. If we want fish, we want algae, we want healthy soil, uh, sorry, water, we don't want nutrients in it. And, What's so fascinating is we, the vet, vetiver can be deployed on floating rafts. Now I started to think about, well, let's not get too carried away, but let's understand the principle at first. So this is like introducing the reed bed principle, but into even perhaps a wild water system. We could float rafts onto a body of water and look how the vetiver is harvesting nutrients from the water. It's obviously converting dissolved nutrients into plant. That plant can be cropped, taken to the land and then utilized. I also wondered about underneath these floating rafts, with the, all of that root matter hanging down. Think about the opportunities for aquatic ecosystems to develop, for fish fry to develop, for um, a food chain uh, to develop that would feed um, you know, large productive fish. Um, think about how in fish farming, these kinds of floating rafts of vetiver could maintain uh, and aerate the water. So we think about how we could introduce these ideas into aquaponic systems. Seems to me kind of the sky's the limit uh, with what we can do here. Um, also is I found this slide which said that, so what happens is again, you put too much nutrient into water, you get a proliferation of things like blue green algae, which can be very toxic and um, What we're seeing here is on the right, a water contaminated with blue green algae. And after four days, um, the vetiver had removed most of the dissolved nitrogens and phosphate. So water treatment with natural methods. We need to understand what we, what we mean by water pollution. And then we understand how we can treat it by using a mixture of gravity and um, a specialist plants and fungi uh, deployed in strategic patterns so that they can selectively remove those nutrients and reoxygenate the soil. Is everybody happy with those core ideas that we've just shared about understanding? Obviously, there's a lot of detail to think about how we would use these ideas, but we'd have understanding the nature of what is water pollution and how we might go about treating it using very simple, natural methods. And of course, 
Number one, the best way to treat polluted water is don't pollute it in the first place. Can we stop things from entering the water course? And we can do that with careful planning. We can do it with, with um, all sorts of different strategies. We could also do it by actually changing our behaviors so we're not putting nutrients into water. So I'm gonna, I've got a, a, a final set of slides, which is um, about composting toilets. Um, here we are. And I think this will serve as our, um, okay. So, yep. Could I mention out something? Please, yes. And, yeah, and probably <clears throat> for the team here, it's key to note the integration. It's not that you're looking at isolated elements, but you're integrating multiple elements. That's why you're having the sand in the wetlands, natural wetlands, and, you know, it's not standalone elements. And if you're looking at designing this, then you can integrate those, all those other elements that we've been looking at, create diversity, as much diversity as possible. Because despite seeing mainly the papyrus in those swampy areas, but it's not only papyrus. If you're to go deep down there, it's, papyrus is basically dominant, but if you're to go in there, you'll find a whole system or an integration of multiple, multiple elements. So if you're designing, it has no harm for you to add bits of biochar, to add gravels, to add uh, sand, or even the vetiver, just make it as integrated as possible. It's really good, Gerald, yeah. Yes, right. That's a good point, Caroline. It really is the 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 don't put it in the water in the first place because we've got to do a lot of work to take it out. So yes, a vetiver pontoons, fantastic, so much potential. But if we hadn't put it in there in the first place, we wouldn't have that problem. So um, there's a thought. So back to toilets, I'm afraid, but. Well, again, we're still on this idea about nutrients in the wrong place and how we actually stop them from moving around and, and, and so that they're in the right place. And then they're not a problem. So there's um, an American gentleman called Joseph Jenkins. And he, I, this book is from his, this picture is from his book, which is called The Human Your Handbook. I think he coined that term um, and here we have a standard long drop toilet. We've all seen them. It's a hole in the ground as deep as we can make it because we want to get rid of that stuff. It's smelly and it's yucky and we want it to go away. We don't want to think about it ever again. That's basically how we deal with toilet waste. And so if we haven't come up with a plan, obviously there's the danger of this is spreading disease. There's the danger of nutrients being in the wrong place. So we dig a hole, get rid of it. But of course, it's going to rain. That do we know whether this hole is going to fill with water? What happens in the wet season? Um, will the pollution, the nutrients from that toilet waste, where will that go? Uh, in the will it interact with the groundwater? Will it turn up somewhere else? It's a fairly random process. And then the other consideration that I introduced is also these long drop toilets, they smell pretty bad. And one of the reasons is it's the uh, ammonia gas, so it's nitrogen escaping. And if that was soaked into carbon, it would be a resource and not a pollution. So something that's good, but it's in the wrong place, becomes bad. Nutrients 
the pollution is nutrients in the wrong place and the right place is a good thing so this is what i kind of grew up with shall we say and this is a a, a, a very common western um interpretation of the dry composting toilet and we i guess we have to be fairly elaborate with it because we're thinking about a wetter climate and um anyway. and this is a twin volt dry composting toilet and i'll explain it for you is we see two brick chambers and but unlike the septic tank which was wet this is dry so this is a toilet system that has no water so we would use one of these chambers until it was full and then we would switch to take our commode our toilet seat put that on the other side and then we would use the second side until that was full if we designed our compost toilet correctly by the time the second side is full the first side will have completely composted and biodegraded down and it'll be about a third of the size of what it was originally and it will just look and smell like crumbly black compost the key thing to achieve this is maintaining the correct carbon and nitrogen ratio that means so toilet waste is high in nitrogen. I showed you that the breakdown from, from um, urine. Um, so toilet waste is high in nitrogen. So every time the rule for every time you use a compost toilet is you add some sawdust or something similar, something um, that's a high form of carbon. Again, biochar, chopped up dry grass just be careful with using wood ash because it's very alkaline and it will affect the ph um wood ash doesn't really contribute to composting although it does contain useful nutrients um i've tried over the years many different materials as a toilet soak material and the best thing is very small particles fine wood dust wood um wood sawdust uh, but really you can use anything that's high carbon um, and you'll notice that there's a cutaway here but the 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 toilet waste is contained in a chamber where there is no light and the commode seat needs to close properly and so that there is no possibility of flies entering and leaving the chamber you don't want to open the seat and a whole bunch of flies coming out because that could be spreading the pathogens. You'll notice, though, that this toilet has a ventilation pipe. And at the end of the ventilation pipe, there's a grill. So if there are any flies inside here, they will see the a speck of light. They'll fly towards it and they'll fly up the pipe and get trapped. And that'll be the end of the fly. So very, very important. And this is dry composting that means that the compost needs to be moist not wet the air spaces need to be the spaces yeah need to be full of air not water so that means reduce the amount of urine going in there you either have to add more soak material or you create a separate urinal area for it's easy for gentlemen standing up or you have a urine separator like i showed you earlier um as well to or you mix the urine together it's fine but you just want to be aware that it mustn't become saturated and wet you get smells or get flies and the compost process will slow right down you always learn by observing so this is the thing that when the carbon and nitrogen ratio are right and the the soil the, the compost heap is aerobic the nutrients are adsorbed, they stick to the carbon, and they don't come back off you. And the only smell you smell is a slightly sweet compost smell, which is a nice smell. So here it is, that's the twin volt dry composting toilet. 
Now, that's a design that suits certain conditions. It can be tweaked. You can alter it. Um, obviously, there's a, there's, there needs to be a drop. We need a difference between the access height for the user and for the maintenance uh, process where we're going to um, compost in situ and move it after it has composted. Ideally, leave it for a year. Um, here's one on flat ground. We we put a, a steps up to it. Um, a similar one here, depending on the shape of the land. Um, here's an upstairs one with the access hatch below in the cellar of a house. And yeah, different configurations to um, to suit the circumstance of where you're at. This C system is what Joseph Jenkins himself uses in his house. And he, um, this, this, this is a small container for the compost, which is then removed and composted elsewhere. So that's the other way of, of doing it. But your carbon and nitrogen ratios right, there's no smell. And what you get at the end of the process is compost. Um, there is that there's one from the farm where I work that's come out of the, of the one of the public toilets. And what you're seeing there is it's sawdust. There's a little bit of blue towel from um, someone washing their hands, but um, it's fully broken down and doesn't in any way resemble what it was originally. Um, and when it's fully broken down like this, we can be sure that it's pathogen free because everything would have been eaten by everything else multiple times. If we were not sure, we'd make another compost heap and compost it again. Um, and <clears throat> here's the, um, this is the, the, the Joseph Jenkins system that he came up with, which is he built a, just a very, a commode with a, a bucket that fits within it. And look how when the lid is down, there's no gap. It just, it's, uh, there's no, there's no definite no risk of leakage. And, um, and when the lid's closed, there's no light between the vessel and the outside. So look, there's a, there's a, yeah, there's a, a, a we can, there's a seat that flips up and then there's the next layer that flips up so we can remove the compost bin. And then normally what you would do is you would have a spare bin and you'd put a, a new bin in the place with maybe an inch or so of, of, of sawdust in the bottom. And every time each person, someone uses the toilet, they cover over with a little bit of sawdust. And there we go. We're turning waste into compost and we're doing it in a controlled, hygienic, safe way. The, the answer to, to what's the best system is it depends on your circumstances. And we might start off with a hole in the ground because that's a short term solution. It solves an immediate problem. But then over time, we might evolve systems to make them more useful, more, um, more efficient at recycling the resources. So, um, and I've also suggested is that one of the ways is maybe just work with the urine at first because that's much less hazardous. And if it goes wrong, you know, it's yeah, there's not much to go wrong really. And to seek it with that is just to soak it into carbon. Okay, how time flies. Um, I kind of rattled through that, but it, it's um, it's 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 a big big topic. There's actually also other approaches to developing with dealing with human waste. I was going to add a few more slides about that, but we'll we'll, we'll, we'll we uh, yeah, that's enough for now. Let's check. If I haven't missed anything that I had planned to show. Okay, great.
Is there any of the things that we've gone through this week that you'd like to just have any questions about or, or, or revisit? Um, but hopefully you can see now I'm trying to give you the building blocks of ideas, how we understand how particular plants work, understand how that might interact with landscape. Um, and that water is always going to be moving through landscapes. So we want to stop it from eroding. We want to harvest the nutrients out of it. And um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. That's a very good point, uh, Deborah, as well. Thank you for your comments. Um, you can, once you've, you've understood the flow of water in your landscape, you can then divert it into pits, into soakaways, and you can have a range of strategies to hold on to it. And, um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, to start to think about how these different things might stack together into much more complex systems. And I think that was where um, Jane Wageza was going with a bit within the, the first presentation about the vetivers. It started getting very detailed. But I could see quickly that with a deeper understanding of these technologies, we could really restore huge swathes of land and restore many of the ecosystems functions that is lost when we have erosion, loss of tree cover, loss of soils. We can we can rebuild, it has been said. Any summary thoughts from you, uh, Gerald? Sorry to put you on the spot. Um it is really interesting how you know most of these concepts especially in the let's say in the african perspective uh things to do with uh humanure are usually no go areas but in practice really when you think beyond the the norms and taboos and cultures around it, you'll find it's, it's a great resource. We've pioneered this in, in the refugee or in the settlements. I usually don't call them refugee camps, I call them settlements. And uh, it's, it's amazing how it was, you know, working out we would do similar ones, but you know, with uh, simply a dig down. And then when it gets full, we would fill it up. And after some time, probably plant a fruit tree. Yeah, and you know, it was progressive. It was, so as a trainer, or if you're aspiring to go into training, you could also look at how best do you handle the cultural aspects of this? How do you best explain it to people that you know they take it on? That, that's a very good point, uh, Gerald, that you just said. And one that is, I've, I've talked about soaking toilet waste into carbon because that's a very good way to compost it. You might not have lots of carbon and you might find that difficult to resource, find those materials. So actually, yes, the other thing you can do with the toilet in a hole in the ground is you just backfill it with soil. So every time it's used, a scoop of soil thrown in that has the same effect, the same impact, it keeps it always covered. There's no possibility for fly so vectors disease. And then as Gerald rightly says, plant trees in it. Um, so I, I heard a story, we talked about the cultural thing. So this is, someone could tell me if this is, they agree with this or not. I heard this story from Malawi, where they had excavated meter cubed holes in the ground, used it as a toilet, backfilled with soil until it was two thirds full, and they planted papaya trees in it. 
And some of the villagers didn't want to eat the papayas because they associated it with the humanure. It was too close a connection. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but really, of course, it's obviously a very safe way of doing it. Yeah, and you know, scientifically speaking, there is no way you're going to have any sort of transmission from you know uh from from the manure or from the waste because it's already broken down and this is a tree yeah you see with quick growing crops like vegetables is understandable though still but then with uh, fruit trees actually if you're to implement it encourage people to plant fruit trees or alternative uh trees which are highly multifunctional sure but uh, we are yet to do an impact evaluation or reassessment of the project in the north we are looking forward to that but we would you know add up data or follow up on such aspects. Uh, Glory, it's as if you had a question or anyone else having a question, please feel free. What, what I might just do, uh, Gerald, if I may, is uh, just refer people to um, this web page and <clears throat> sector 39 we have our academy website um and what i do each week if you go onto that website we'll put the address for you and um, you'll see a menu there pdc 2023 and there is a page for each one of these sessions so there's 2309 natural resources this is today's lesson um lesson nine and beginning of the second term so i put the lessons plans there outline and here's a picture of a raised bed um that's catching and storing uh rainfall and to just get us think about earthworks water treatment valuing natural resources um the video of this lecture will go here and then these um buttons here link you to the slideshows which i've just showed you so you can download those as you want if you wanted for your own um reference and i've also arranged a few really interesting videos on the the on carrying on on the um about compost toilets human oil composting um how to clean water with plants um uh, water catchment on a big scale in india it's very exciting and um also yeah more things about water treatment so tons of resource and um do yeah access as much as you can All right it seems we have a question from uh, peter and then nicholas i think let's start off with peter and then nicholas thanks steve Peter. Okay, thank you for giving me this opportunity. This is the come get. Uh, I wanted to know how long does the biochar take in the soil? When it's applied, how long does it take? For you, for you to, to keep on adding, how long does it take? Yeah, great. Now this is Simon. Uh, I wanted to supplement on biochar. The other time when we talked of purification of water as in the data aspect has come in vetiver and so forth, uh, biochar it is also helps us in the purification of the water whereby a man can use or a human being can use or any living organism can utilize The, the other thing is biochar is also so vital to living animals, whereby it helps in the treating or to expel some bacteria 
that are in the rumen or in the stomach. Poison that helps us to neutralize that acidity in a human being. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Simon. Yes, Nicholas. Thanks, Simon. Go on, Nicholas. Okay, thank you, Simon. Very nice. Uh, but uh, I don't have a question. I just want to thank people for today's lesson. That uh, I would ask if I can get the the presentation of what I know that uh, a soft code. Sure. Um, thanks, Nicholas. We we look up some materials, and uh, most of the materials are on the website. But then we can look up some additional materials. Okay. Okay, Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying not to overwhelm you with too many links and too many videos because there is a lot of stuff out of there which you will find very helpful. I'm trying to guide your permaculture learning by taking you through these 12 principles and kind of giving a shape to it rather than us just jump straight to sack garden raised bed. Did you get me? We're trying to... Yeah. I understand that the why we do these things as well and understand the principles behind it. But this is and, and I'm going to be so interested to hear all of your examples of how you're using these ideas. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, and uh, yes, Simon, thanks for that uh, feedback also on Biochair. And uh, glad to know that you're with someone else. Sorry, I didn't get the name, but could for numbers purposes, could we also know like per each broadcast or per each uh, person or per each gadget logged in, if you could let us know the, the participants you're having behind, it would be good for our numbers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Yes. Uh, I'm here with some five members. Okay. Uh, I've got Amuriat. Okay. Amuriat Isaac. Okay. Uh, I've got the chairperson here of Tapa. Johnson Nelodai. Uh, Simon Peter, the chairperson of Apade. Okay. Uh, and then. Oh. And then I have here a member, one of the member of Julius and the other one who has just gone in for short call, who is called Samuel Arin. Oh, thank you. Great to have you. So, uh, plus Deborah, and greetings to all the members. Uh, Deborah, your network seems to be a little bit weak. Um, Deborah, okay, as, as Deborah suits out or tries to find a good spot for the network, uh, Caroline, you have, uh, Caroline, you have a question. Uh, no, it's not really a question. Uh, I'm just uh, answering, but- Please something. Caroline, okay, let, let, let Deborah, okay. Oh, sorry. Again, both of you have muted. Okay, Deborah? Yes, I'm getting, my network has been poor here. Okay, we, we are hearing you now. Okay, thank you so much for the contribution. Though I would be wanted also to contribute on the Lorena stoves. Uh, as also one of the way uh, we can connect systems, but uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank everyone and the TAPA members also. Thank you so much, Steve, contributions for today. Thank you, everyone. 
<laughs> thank you, Deborah. And we will we we will let us plan a time slot for you to talk about Lorena stoves. That would be really good. Um, you know, in one of the coming weeks. And and especially your experiences of the train, you know, firstly the design, but also how you've taught the, the teaching process and what you've learned. So we, we really look forward to hearing from you on on that subject. Okay, thanks, Deborah. Thanks, Dave. Um, Karen. Um, okay, uh, I did not have a question. I just had an observation. Uh, Steve was uh, trying to explain the way he's teaching style. And uh, I think it's very, it's very okay because he does it in such a way that uh, even somebody like me who had issues with physics, biology, and chemistry, somehow, you know, I'm managing to understand what I'm doing. And uh, that is key, especially when uh, we go back to the villages and we are training people who probably never went beyond primary school level. Um, we will borrow a lot from Steve's teaching because it's uh, very basic and uh, it sinks in. You understand what you're doing. And uh, I think we, we are comfortable. I am very comfortable with that. And uh, I also want to thank everybody who's here today, especially the TAPA members, uh, because it means that uh, it's 10 o'clock now, but they are all in somebody's place. Uh, we want to applaud them, keep that spirit up. Uh, you know, it's, it's good, it's nice. Thank you all. Oh, thanks, Caroline. That is brilliant feedback. And uh, to all our members, because I understand at least 90% of us are looking at, you know, taking it on as trainers. Yeah. So that feedback is really a lift to borrow or to take home. And it is it coincides with one of the discussions we had earlier with Steve that looking at the, your target trainers or learners or the people we are looking at, because you're looking at working with the very basic or to be all inclusive for the entire society. So the more simplified you make it, the more basic you make it, the better. Yes, you could be knowing the concepts or the scientific language, but the more simplified you make it, the better, because that draws now the line between what we are doing and the academic kind of setup. Yeah? Maybe if you happen to address bigger uh gatherings and you realize is particularly for academicians or people into the academic line then you can use those terms or the big terms but if you're working you know with a layman out there you know the person who is really bound to benefit from our our kind of work who are taking it on as a survival technique or a you know, their only option for survival, then it's really vital to really keep, keep it as simple or as simplified as possible. Thanks, Caroline. Um, do we have any other questions or any other contributions? Sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, Joseph or Glory, it would be good, you know, just to have a word from you. Okay. Okay. Um, it, it's all right, please. Uh, Steve, if we don't have any other, you know, contribution or remarks. 
Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, no, thank you, everyone. I was just saying, yes, about it's. We're trying to teach the patterns first because the real world's so detailed. We'd get lost in all the names. We could know the name of every kind of soil bacteria. But we don't need to. We just need to know how it works and create the right conditions. Hey, nature knows what it's doing. So thank you, everyone. We've had some lovely uh, uh, feedback and interactions this week, and I really look forward to seeing you all next week. And don't forget to visit the web page. I did put the link there, and it'll be on Facebook as well. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <Bye-bye. laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.